Now I'm really, really happy um, to announce uh, Julian. Julian is going to talk about biohack spaces and is going to share their knowledge on them with us. So please give a warm welcome, ming applause to Julian. Hi. Okay. Um, oh, that went faster than I thought. Oh. Hi, I'm going to talk about uh, biohack spaces. This might be a little rushed because originally I had much more time in, in mind when I, and, uh, when I applied for the talk. Um, I'm going to quickly tell you who I am. I'm going to give you a very brief, like, 120 seconds uh, history of uh, how the hackerspace movement star got, got its traction uh, 16 years ago. Um, and then I'm going to go into biohack labs, especially in the Curious Community Labs, which I am a part of, talk a little about our projects. And then I'm tell going to tell you why this is all uh, important and very dear to my heart. Who am I? I'm Julian. Today I like to use they and then pronouns. I'm 42, but I really don't have any answers for you. Um, I live in Hamburg, and I'm part of the Curious Community Labs, which we founded in 2020, um, out of a group of people who had been doing um, DIY biology before. And I've also been part of the CCC for 20 years uh, this year. Um, history of hackerspaces, and I think this is sort of important to know your roots. In 2007, I, who of you has been, well, went to the camp in 2007, or who of you has been around in 2007? In 2007, there was a, a fairly, a fairly um, uh, there was an inflection point because um, there was a, after the camp of 2007, there was a tour of European hackerspaces and a bunch of American hackers, most notably Dan Kaminsky, we all dearly miss him. Nick Farr, Brie Pettis, Mitch Altman, and a couple of others did a tour around uh, European hackerspaces and visited the Seabase, Metalab in Vienna, Entropia in Karlsruhe, uh, the Chaos Computer Club in Cologne, which was sort of the biggest and mo most notable hack spaces around at that time. And um, Joel and um, Pulon did a talk about hackspace blueprints, and out of that came a whole explosion of hack spaces. Uh, after that, NYC Resistor was founded in New York, uh, Hanoi's Bridge in uh, San Francisco, and just, I don't know, about 50 different hack spaces within the next 18 months. So this entire um, explosion of hack spaces and everything that has trickled down from there is sort of due to the camp in 2007 somehow, and due to these people, I would like to give a shout out. And also a shout out to the original sort of European hack spaces like Seabase and Metalab and Utropia, C4. And uh, obviously don't forget the roots in the US as well, like Loft and others. Um, the world is very different today. Uh, the whole entire movement has changed, hacker spaces have changed, but this is, um, the, 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 it, I think it's quite important to know your roots and also understand that small inflection points really can start a movement and Inspire, inspire others and um, and so on. Um, I, after about 17 years in the uh, uh, hacker community, um, in 2000, uh, in 2020, started being very interested in growing my own mushrooms, and out of that, sort of started joining the biopunk movement, um, which I'm going to quickly sort of give you an overview of. Um, what I mean when I say that, we are very much about DIY grassroots biology, and I understand that grassroots is a really funny word here. We are very diverse and not entirely definable, uh, just as you can't really grasp what nature actually is. Um, there's people doing stuff with DNA, there's people growing mushrooms, there's people going foraging, picking stuff, fermenting, playing with yeasts, inventing new foods, everything around that. Um, very diverse. Um, there's all sorts of projects all around Europe, but very few actual dedicated biohack spaces. We are curious about biology. We're curious about open source and sharing and teaching and learning just as well as the uh, electronics and computer-based hack scene. Um, some of us mo focus more on fungi, others on microbiology. In H Hamburg, we're very, we're very sort of fungi focused uh, group, but we also do a couple of other things. And we are sort of separate from what my, someone might understand as this sort of old school biohacker um, body modification kind of scene. People who um, people who work with their own body and try to optimize and so it's not really the same kind of people in any sense. Um, what we are more closely to is sort of the solar punk movement, people are thinking about autonom being autonomous, going off grid, um, these kind of people and then obviously we are sort of intertwined with the hacker movement as well. Um, in Hamburg we founded the Curious Community Labs 
We have 42 square meters. Uh, we have some extra areas. It's all in the Oberhafen in Hamburg. If you ever come by, please, you know, have, have a look at us. If you live in Hamburg, please come visit. Um, we have 23 members, and those numbers aren't made up, neither the 42 nor the 23. Um, and we have a bunch of gear standing around that we can use to do our own DIY biology. Some is very new, some is sort of foraged from from uh, uh, industry, uh, you know, from, from companies throwing out old, old hardware, and we give it a new life. We grow mushrooms with a flow hood, which is a sterile workbench. We have an, a big, massive autoclave. We have grow tents. We have uh, someone sponsored us some DNA sequencing hardware. We got a big grant to build the Garden of the Future, which has a massive weather station and the, and the greenhouse. And we're certainly not the only biohack space around, but it's sort of hard to grasp, and there's not really this sort of you know, website collecting everything like this on hackspaces.org. So, you know, if you are part of your own biohack space, please, you know, contact me afterwards. I'm happy to network. Um, there's a bunch of people around Berlin as well. There's, uh, there's obviously online, there's a couple of groups and, and, and people being interested in different topics. Our lab looks a little like this. Um, there's also a bunch of equipment standing around that and uh, stuff that you can't see because it's you know sort of distributed. And we have a bunch of projects. Um, currently, uh, most prominent is the Stadtpilze or city mushrooms, which got sponsored by the city of Hamburg. Um, we do some mushroom lamps. We build the garden of the future, as I just said. We go on foraging trips. We do food experiments and an experiment with all sorts of new ideas of ways of fermenting things and growing yeasts and uh, inventing new ways of doing things with uh, combining mycelium with uh, grains. And then we also have people who built a little company building acoustic absorbing mycelium based composite mater materials and so on and so on and so on. So that's very diverse and I really have to rush through there a little because um, I'm going to into the project a little more in depth now. Um, the Stadtpilze is basically the idea of taking a bucket that you can get at any restaurant you like because they throw them out filling it with cardboard with uh, coffee grounds with uh, different other mm, substrate straw and so on and so on and we built this whole brochure that makes it very accessible for people to grow their own mushrooms and this looks like come on this um which is um which is a uh, rose oyster mushroom or a pink oyster mushroom um, which you can then grow yourself on your on your windowsill and uh, and eat, and it's very delicious. Um, so, being sustainable about your own food is sort of one part of m what motivates us. Um, then we work with model novel mycelium-based ma uh, materials, most notably uh, the mushroom lamp, which um, Matti built, um, which is a and I'll show you how this stuff is made in a second, but it's basically, it feels a little like uh, polystyrene. It has sort of lightweight, but it's very firm, and you can use it. Uh, it's 100% it's biodegradable, and it, it is built out of uh, straw and buckwheat and, uh, and uh, mycelium. And then uh, this becomes a lampshade. Um, we grow mushrooms. We have our own grow tent, which looks about a little like this. And we do this in a sterile work environment, so you need a you need a a flow hood or some other way of keeping your environment sterile. This uh, pressure puts pressured air through through a HEPA filter, so the, the and, and you know you disinfect obviously, but that that allows you to keep the stuff uh, clean. The, I don't know if Sebastian is around. No, okay. Uh, Sebastian has the project with uh, building a planktoscope, which is a high-speed photography plankton um, uh, analyzing water and seeing what lives in there. And uh, with uh, Raspberry Pi and some high-speed photography, I think 8,000 pictures per second, and then you can see what flows through there and what is actually in there and count um, what is in there. We have group activities. We go out and forage mushrooms and prepare them and uh, also learn about them understand how to identify them, etc., etc. We go out into nature, which I know for some might be scary, but uh, we actually love to do this kind of stuff. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little about my own little project to illustrate a little more what can be done, and also because I know the most about what I do myself. 
Um, so last year I started building, uh, last, I started playing the trumpet again, which had been a hobby when I was like a child, and then I stopped, and then I, you know, started playing again, and I live in the middle of the city, so obviously my neighbors are not too happy about this. Now, you can buy mutes and stick them in the trumpet, but they restrict the airflow, and that's sort of not really fun. Or you can buy these things for about 500 euros, which is sort of a barrel with some uh, sound insulation. And you play inside, and it's quiet, and uh, nobody gets disturbed, and it's quite nice. But it's also 500 euros, and these things are made of plastic and, uh, you know, uh, not, not entirely great. Um, however, I still bought one because I needed one urgently. And then I thought, well, I think I can make this myself. So act one, I got myself a metal barrel and cut off the top. Act two is that I uh, 3D printed a mold um, that I could use to create the waveform uh, that reflects sound. Act three is that I grew a bunch of mycelium. And the way you do this is you take some, you take some um, carbohydrates like uh, rye, you sterilize it, you inject some uh, liquid mycelium or spores in there, you let it grow under, uh, under good conditions, and then you mix it up with some substrate. For example, in my case, I used uh, rapeseed uh, straw, and I used buckwheat uh, shells. And I mixed them in a two-to-one uh, um, uh, relation and mixed it all up with mycelium. And then um, I used reishi mushroom, which is a medicinal mushroom, but it also has incredible propagating properties like this stuff grows like crazy and it's uh, it's very hard to get any molding or uh, rotting in there um so i used that and then i shredded it all and uh ran it through a clean thr shredder and then i placed it all together and placed it all together and let it grow for about a week and then i had this and then I took out the mold, and then I dried it, and now I can play my trumpet into this. And it is 100% uh, compostable, it uh, is completely DIY, and uh, it also keeps my neighbor f neighbors from complaining. So that is uh, what I built this winter. Um, so you can have a lot of fun, and there's a million of applications of growing your own mushrooms, of understanding nature around you, building your own food, working with different kinds of components. Um, also, building tools and, um, and software and hardware to, um, to help, um, you know, to, to make this even, more, even easier and, 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 and create less, um, less uh, what do you call it, uh, throw, you know, you don't have to throw that much away for example, or, you know, understanding more about the strains you're building, uh, microscoping stuff, cut, uh, you know, organizing the different samples, etc., etc. So there's a bunch of things to do, and it's incredibly fun. And I've only, I have only been at it for, like, if you're honest, like, about two years. So there's a very, very steep learning curve in just doing your own stuff and, uh, and, and understanding a little more about what surrounds you. And that's why I think this is important. Um, first of all, this planet is burning, and this is very urgent. We need to find solutions, and we need to be—we need to find big solutions, but also small ones. And we need to do this urgently, and without the uh, sort of belief that capitalism can save any of this, we need to go—we need to go in there and do little, quick projects to iterate and to share our knowledge and to become more resilient. Um, we need to learn to grow our own stuff, and we need to how we need to learn how to forage and preserve food and make it delicious, and go out uh, into nature and understand what surrounds us. Um, I think the idea that we are somehow as humans separate from nature is a deeply, deeply patriarchal, colonialist, extractivist idea, and this has to change. We are not in any way separate from nature. We are very much part of nature and we need to understand what surrounds us. If we don't, if we still believe we can somehow force nature under our will, we will go under. So please decolonize, decolonize yourself. Please understand that the idea of somehow conquering the world is a really, really, really dreadful one.
Thank you. And now you, hackers, um, people who are interested, we need you. Many projects that we do require knowledge of computers and electronics, uh, require an understanding of physics and mechanics, and um, there's so much to discover and learn and share, and there's so much fun in this, because at the end, often it's very delicious as well, um, and or useful, or anything, and it, you know, what we do usually uh, is very, very sustainable, doesn't require shipping parts from the other part of the planet and then throwing them out because you, you know, did a wrong solder. Um, you can't, as I said, you can't change the fundamental laws of nature, but if you really start listening, nature can start changing you, and that is what we need as a society. So please, join a space, start your own, um, talk to us, uh, start doing some in your own hack spaces. Um, we offer some support, we offer network, we are open for networking to others. Um, you know, you can just reach me, you can reach me after the talk, you can go to uh, our website, curious.bio, you can write to me, you can talk to me, um, and I rush through all of this to have two and a half minutes of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian, for sharing your experiences and showing off this great mold you grew. So, if you have any questions, there is a wonderful angel with a microphone that is more or less that you can go to and queue and ask maybe one or two questions. So, please, shoot. Hey, um, curious if you're doing anything with genetic engineering or trying to figure out how to get approval to be allowed to do that within the European Union? Uh, n no, uh, we don't do it. I know there's projects who do do this kind of stuff. Um, it is obviously dangerous. It also requires a, a shit ton of equipment that we do not have. Um, I have no idea about the approval. That's why we grow mushrooms. I mean, there's also a huge, you know, most of the stuff we do is patented, so you can't actually commercialize it. Um, but you very much can do your open source version of it. And that's sort of for now. Um, I know there's some projects, but we don't. Hello. Um, how resistant is this material against, like, um, like humidity and this kind of... Humidity... Hum Hello? Oh. Humidity, uh, not so good. Um, fire, quite good. Um, I don't know the exact specifications, but there's been a paper on fire resistance, and it's sort of, it doesn't burn, it just smolders, so it's, uh, it's decent. Um, yeah, you don't want to put this stuff in, in your basement or, or outside, that's just not, it's going to draw water. Um, and it needs to dry, you need a drying chamber, because it dies, at, the mycelium dies at 70 degrees. So you need to get it to 70 degrees, often dry it for a while to get it really dry. But once it's dry and it's, it's in your home, it's great. And if it's a little more moist in your, in your home, it'll just absorb moisture and then just let it go once it, once it stops being moist. So, you, know. uh, you almost answered my question already, but uh, 70 degrees, that's centigrade? Or? Yes. <laughs> yes, 70 degrees and centigrade. What do you think uh, is the density? Is it more like styrofoam, like very light, or is it more like cardboard? It, it's more like polystyrene. It depends on, the, on very many factors. You can tweak this. You can play around with the substrate composition. You can, the longer you let it grow, the, thick, the denser it becomes, so you have to stop it at a certain point, etc., etc. So it really depends on, on what you... Uh, on what you um, yeah. You can tweak it up and down. Yeah, there's, yeah you can totally do that. Um, I was wondering if there's a way to get more specific details on how to make the audio tunnel. On, yeah, it's yeah. There is okay. <laughs> it's a, it's a three D model I built basically by asking around on the internet and uh, figuring out and asking uh, actually going on YouTube, seeing something similar, talking to the t guy who made the tutorial and asking me how he would did it, and he did a tutorial for me. Okay, so it's all <laughs> accessible online. Yeah, it's sort of. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Thank you. We're done. Thank you very much. I, oh, oh, a question. Yeah, but we are. 
we are over time. Okay, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I just have a question uh, to connect with people. Uh, I'm looking for experienced people who have um, experience in DIY hormone production for HRT. So if yeah. you want mm -hmm. to find me later, I'm at uh, Art and Play over there and I will stay here a while and also post it on a bulletin. That is um, super important. I know there's a couple of projects around there. There's no, none where we... Yeah. But I know this is a very, very important thing. Just because so thank it's you biohacking for mentioning here. It. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hormone, re replacement hormone replacement therapy. Hormone replacement therapy, often for trans people, but also for women in menopause. Yeah. Okay. I'll answer your question after the talk. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>